of the few stone tablets that survived our long journey across the Great Water are to be believed, then the Scholar King, and most of his successors, have always tried to warn us about two things – ignorance and complacency. Both of these mindsets are dangerous on their own, as they cause one to close their mind and ignore the world around them. But when combined together, they become destroyers of entire civilizations. And yet, despite these warnings, when our people celebrated forced unification with the last of the independent Ainu, they fell to both of these maladies. We thought that we have conquered the entirety of our world, from great water to the west to great water in the east. Our new home was safe, we told ourselves, clearly forgetting just how large said world was, something that we have seen with our own eyes during our journey. It was that ignorance and complacency that almost ended our story there and then, when the warriors from the southern lands have arrived, a mad, deranged culture obsessed with war and death, eager to cut down everyone in their path with their curved blades, which, if they themselves are to be believed, were not just weapons, but extensions of their very souls. Before that happened, however, Agatan had to deal with more domestic affairs. Their military victory over the last remaining Ainu might have been complete, but while warriors defending them were defeated, local population still had to be brought to heel and assimilated into their new nation, a process that was all the more difficult due to serious cultural differences. At the very least, there was little resentment between locals and their Mayan conquerors. Thanks to order from the Akatani king himself, his warriors left native population alone and allowed them to carry on with their lives, without suffering pillaging and plundering of their lands, something that was very common practice during time of warring tribes. Back home, however, the king of Akatan had other matters on his hand. While his officials and lower chieftains were sent to the western side of the island to establish control, back in the floating city, the court was filled to the brim with new arrivals on Akatani political scene. A cast of rich merchants, commoners by birth but owning vast amounts of wealth, and by facilitating exchange of goods in the rapidly growing colony. These men had nothing or very little to themselves when the floating city was established, but they were clever enough to use Akatan's expansion to place themselves in the middle of growing trade routes. And, by late 1446, these merchant families were influential enough to approach Akatani royalty with an interesting request. They wished to use their wealth to purchase one thing they could not attain before – noble titles. They argued that, unlike many of lesser chieftains, they contributed far more to the growing nation, and as such they should no longer be forbidden from climbing up the social ranks. The nobles, as expected, objected to the idea fervently, claiming that if titles could be bought just by wealth, then they would quickly lose all their meaning. What's more, they also argued that if gold was enough to buy rank of a chieftain, then a large enough amount of it could even make someone a king. Debates erupted in the court as both sides tried to press their agendas to the king, but in the end, the old monarch decided to pick the side of already established nobility, reasoning that stability was critical for both himself and his entire nation to fulfill their mission, much to dismay of his wealthy but lowborn subjects. Still, in order to at least try and appease the merchants, if only to ensure that their wealth would remain readily available, the king issued an edict that granted several most influential trade groups special privileges, essentially giving them monopoly on certain resources, which would even more expand wealth of these already rich groups. But while this conflict between merchants and nobles was an important affair, it was overshadowed by another one. The priests, still bitter about losing privileged status they had before Exodus, continued to preach their doom-mongering tales of appeasing the gods through blood sacrifices. These fanatical stories carried little weight in the courts of the floating city, but out in the province, Akatani settlers were more than willing to rally behind their local priests, and soon their voices were heard even in the throne room itself. A delegation of most notable priests approached the king and demanded him to return to his position as the High Diviner, a link between his people and the gods. Ever since Akatan was founded, his majesty kept that role and name only, claiming that in this new land, bloody laws of the gods held no sway, and that he would never again raise his ceremonial obsidian dagger to nourish these deities with even a drop of blood. Now though, with hundreds of commoners rallied behind the priests, he had no choice but to, at the very least, listen to their claims. And yet, 
With cries of his people at their back, the priests were ignored. The king was adamant in his decision, and argued that the gods themselves were, perhaps, victims of some far greater curse, the same one that doomed Mayan people into their endless cycle of destruction. Unfortunately, though, these arguments meant nothing to the priests. They left the palace outraged and furious, and very soon started working to undermine efforts of peaceful religious assimilation of Ainu tribes. At this point, several more mildly mannered priests were already working on spreading Mayan religion to their new Ainu subjects, but they were quickly joined by bands of zealous, fanatical missionaries, whose only job seemed to be a complete destruction of native religion. These priests denounce all idols worshipped by the locals and, what's worse, convinced many of the Mayan settlers, and those few Ainus who were already converted, that allowing locals to continue their religious practices would bring doom to them all. It wasn't long before first religious riots took place in Ainu territories, which even further deepened mistrust between natives and their new Mayan leaders. And perhaps that would have been the end of internal political issues, if not for the fact that, in late year 1447, after leading his nation for several decades and turning it from a small colony into a dominant regional power, the King of Akaton died. It was a peaceful death of old age, death of a man who was more than just a leader, he was a symbol. At the start of his reign, Akatan was almost nothing, a few buildings and survivors of a dead empire, terrified and far away from home. At the moment of his death, though, they not only managed to survive their rough start, they also spread their influence and brought local warring tribes under a single banner. As such, ceremonial funeral of the first king of Akatan was a somber, serious affair, but as soon as his soul was sent to the afterlife, political games erupted anew. The king used to have a son, brave, serious and wise young man, always eager to jump headfirst into troubles and resolve them with effortless skill. With his death in the Ainu ambush, however, his place as the heir was taken by his younger sister Nayeli, who, at the time of her coronation, was barely 17 years old. Seeing such an opportunity, political powers in Akatan, priests, nobles, merchants and even assimilated Ainu chieftains began vying for her support, hoping to use this new, unproven young queen as a puppet. But Nayeli was not an innocent, naive fool everyone thought her to be. What she lacked in experience, she more than made up in natural skill, education and sheer determination, and although her diplomatic abilities were nowhere near the ones possessed by her father, she was still able to keep the grip on different factions at her court and kept them under control with her administrative skills, which were said to be second to none. And, aside from her father's calm demeanour, which helped her keep the nation in order, she also inherited his mission. Akatan had to grow and prosper in order to build up enough power to return home and free their ancestral homeland from the curse. No task was more important than that, and Nayeli, with dark circles under her eyes from crying after her lost father, would stop at nothing to see it done. From this day forward, she would never cry again, even as the world around her seemed determined to test her resolve at all costs. The first order of business for Nayeli was to establish her position as the queen, not only in the court of the floating city, but across the entire kingdom. With factions close to the throne still busy with their own schemes, the queen dispatched a vast number of officials, chieftains, warriors, loyal priests and scribes, all across Akatan. Their missions varied, depending on locations they were sent to, but the overall goal was the same to ensure that everyone in Akatan knew that continuity of leadership was held, and that the Queen, despite her young age, was not someone that could be just ignored or taken advantage of. But aside from these emissaries of peace, Queen Nayeli also dispatched more sinister forces into her lands, namely into newly conquered lands of the Ainu. With recent religious unrest, many of the natives started to resent their new Mayan leadership, and as months went by and more and more of the Ainu were sacrificed on the stone altars, the remaining ones became galvanized against Akatani occupation. Patrols were attacked, officials killed in their homes, and even some of the priests were found slaughtered and bled dry in mock versions of their own rituals. Their war chiefs might have been defeated, but the Ainu people were not yet fully broken, and so it was clear that a violent rebellion was just a matter of time. 
Queen Nayeli, however, knew all that. Her father realized that his idealistic dream of uniting the land would be faced with serious opposition, and as such, he placed some of his loyal Ainu subjects among the rebels, in order to keep tabs on the brewing unrest. And now, prompted by the increasingly alarming reports, the Queen decided to take the initiative. Several groups of elite warriors from the Royal Guard were dispatched into Shiribeshi, western side of the kingdom and a breeding ground of the rebels, in order to decimate leadership of this rebellion before it could explode. And over the next few months, these units performed their job with dreadful efficiency, raiding rebel safe houses and putting many of their leaders to the sword, or at the very least to an obsidian mace. And although their actions were not as decisive as Queen hoped, the fear they caused certainly managed to delay the rebellion for many months. All that, however, was overshadowed by rapidly spreading knowledge about another landmass further to the south. The existence of this land was not a mystery for a long time. After all, the very first Ainu Mayans have encountered told of their ancestral homeland that was stolen from them by southern invaders. Still, until the tribes were united under Akitani banner, the existence of this land was of little consequence, as it was simply too far away to bother with. Now, however, this began to change. The large southern island, called Nippon by its current inhabitants, suddenly became much, much closer as Akitani scouts found outposts that these southerners have established on their island. A number of lesser Ainu chieftains fled to these outposts, preferring enemies they had already knew over the weird invaders from across the ocean, and spread rumors that severely damaged Akatani reputation amongst the southerners, before official contact was actually established. Because of that, when first Mayan scouts and emissaries traveled south to learn something about these mysterious southerners, they were met with a cold reception. Not outright hostility, but it was always clear that violence was not something these people would try to avoid. Regardless of that, however, many traders went south anyway, hoping to at the very least engage in some limited exchange. And although they were never met with open arms, their ventures still brought some much-needed wealth to their homeland. More importantly, though, they brought back with them knowledge about this new land, which, if said merchants were to be believed, was engulfed in complete and utter chaos. In theory, the land of Nippon was ruled by an emperor, but he was, for many generations now, kept only as a symbol and a puppet. True power, instead, was held by the Shogun, a military ruler of entire land who lorded over his vassals, the Daimyo. Except, as it quickly became evident, said rulership was only working in theory. In practice, the entire landmass was locked in near-constant state of war, as local warlords made and broke alliances and declared wars left and right to increase their power base. The shogunate, it seemed, was no longer a respectable power it used to be, and had no way to enforce its will, plunging the nation into chaos and disunity. And yet, this did not make the inhabitants of these lands any less dangerous. If anything, it only made them more violent and used to constant war. As generations went by and no victors of the endless power struggle emerged, the locals have developed a specific warrior culture, in which their entire, disjointed realms walked with sole purpose of waging more and more conflicts. Warriors were held in highest regard, and a specific court of honor was established, though very rarely upheld, as entire political scene seemed to be full of constant treacheries and backstabs. Still, all this made these southerners extremely dangerous, as Akatani scouts soon learned in their ventures in the southern parts of their island. Warriors of the local daimyo were not only far better armed than their Mayan counterparts, wielding metal blades, deadly bows, and wearing resilient armor, they were also far more used to war, and responded with deadly force to every single incursion into their territory. Now, it may seem that at this point sending scouts to the south was a mistake, given the circumstances, but the Queen realized that, despite all potential dangers, her people had to move to the south anyway, if they ever wanted to completely unite the island that was their new home. And, perhaps as a sudden stroke of good luck, an opportunity unlike any other presented itself in form of Ando clan. Over the past few years, the clan saw meteoric rise as it managed to conquer a decent part of northern Nippon, but just as quickly as their fortunes rose, they fell as another, even more powerful daimyo of Uesugi marched north and all but obliterated Ando armies in a series of decisive battles. 
As a result, remnants of the clan were forced to flee north, to the island called Hokkaido, where Akatan now lied. In itself, that meant very little. After all, even though that clan was weak on its own, it was still, at least in theory, protected by the Shogun. And while the military overlord of Nippon cared little about squabbles between his vassals, he would no doubt intervene if a foreign power, especially such an outlandish one as Agatan, tried to conquer one of his subjects. Except, this particular case was an exception. After losing all their mainland territories, Daimyo of Ando lost all influence in imperial and shogunate courts, furthered even more by rapidly growing power of his Uesugi rivals. As such, Clan Ando stood alone, and while its warriors were still more than a match for Akatani armies, their sudden isolation gave Mayan refugees an opportunity to finally secure the island that was now their home. Yet, amongst all the political and military manoeuvres, it is important to remember that the Queen was not just a brilliant administrator and a wise leader, she was also a young woman, and so she was not above simple matters of the heart. So it comes as no surprise that, mere few years after being inaugurated as a Queen, she found herself a Prince, not just to keep her company or to help her with everyday management of the growing kingdom, but also to ensure that she would have an heir someone who would inherit the Arana name and the mission they received from the Scholar King. And a suitable prince turned out to be one of the military commanders, a war chief by the name of Amik. He was born in Akatan into a family of warriors. In fact, their new prince was a distant relative of the commander of the Royal Guard, and quickly rose to become one of the most prominent members of his bloodline. And although Akatani by birth, he was one of the first to move in to the western side of the island, to newly conquered Ainu territories, to use his military prowess to keep the area under control. Once he arrived there, however, it wasn't long before he became infatuated with the locals, their customs, religion and culture, so much, in fact, that one of the points in the marriage contract between him and Queen Inayeli stated that Akatani royalty would cease all attempts at forceful conversion of their new subjects, and would even increase local autonomy they enjoyed. The priests, of course, objected, but the Queen was not above making some concessions for the man with whom she, according to all historical records, shared a mutual love, especially since he was very much liked by Ainu and Mayan subjects alike. And so, in the year 1450, the marriage was sworn, and the pair was soon blessed with a son, Enoki. The wedding was a ceremonious affair, despite outrage of some of the more conservative priests, and the prince even managed to invite some of the native chieftains, who were now in his debt. The future seemed to look well. For the Mayans, the succession of their royal line was now secure, and as for the Ainu, they realized that thanks to Prince Amik's intervention, their cultural and religious identity would remain safe for decades to come. It wasn't long, however, before traditional values of Mayan culture were once again shaken by the new way of thinking, introduced by the scholar king and his successors. In the northern part of the island lie the city of Zibalba, named so because, just like the fabled Mayan underworld, it was located in a series of caves running under a mountain. These caves were feared by the locals, who often claimed that they were inhabited by evil spirits, but the Mayans quickly adopted this sprawling underground lair because it offered protection from the harsh weather. But there was another reason. Per orders of the previous king, Zibalba was a heart of Akatani scholarship. Wise men from across the nation could move there and conduct their own experiments out of sight of more conservatively-minded commoners and priests, who often considered all kinds of progress as heretical. Unfortunately, though, some of the scholars have crossed the line and approached the queen in her own throne room, asking for a macabre favour. They wished to have access to dead bodies in order to study them in hopes of figuring out how they work. But, of course, mentioning such practices in the open was a grave mistake. Court priests stepped in almost immediately, demanding that these practices would be put to an end, rallying local population with talks of grave-robbing, sacrilegious, heretical scholars, whose madness defiled both spirits of the ancestors and gods alike. 
That, as you might expect, put the Queen in a difficult position. At one hand, she understood the desperate need for more knowledge. After all, recent years showed just how backwards the Mayans were when compared to the locals. But on the other, allowing these dissections to continue would no doubt mean even more troubles, both from the priests and the population itself, as they were terrified by such bizarre practices. The decision was a difficult one, and the Queen retired for several days to ponder her options. In the end, though, she remained true to her father's wishes and her own mind, and officially endorsed these anatomical theatres, as they were called. The reason, of course, was easy to predict. The scholars were happy, but some of the priests stormed off from the palace and went into the countryside to spread the word about these ungodly practices, causing fear and discontent wherever they went. By the time Zibalban delegation returned home, they had to be escorted by a group of elite warriors, who then had to stay in the underground city as a permanent garrison to prevent angry mobs from storming the place and slaughtering the scholars. Some riots even reached the floating city itself, but they fell on deaf ears. The Queen was confident in her decision, knowing that the only way for her people was to push forward, without remorse and without ties to the past. Keeping things as they always were would only mean doom for all of Akatan. Yet, all these matters were rapidly being overshadowed by more news from the south. During these past few years, some Akatani merchants made journeys into the southern landmass and even reached its theoretical capital, a magnificent, resplendent city of Kyoto, where the seat of the shogunate was located. The rest of the great island might have been consumed by constant wars between bickering daimyos, but the capital remained serene and became one of the major places where goods of Nippon and Akatan were exchanged. More importantly, though, as the merchants returned, they brought with them news about the geopolitical situation. None of these news, however, were more important than those regarding remnants of once powerful Ando clan. According to latest rumors, the leader of this clan, one Yasuse Ando, has lost all influence in the court and was even considered to be disgraced, as Shogun himself, probably convinced by generous bribes from the Uesugi, stated that Daimyo Yasuse should commit suicide. The Lord, however, did no such thing, and so technically became a rebel and an outcast. These political games between natives meant little to Akatan on their own, but the result was hard to overstate. The Ando clan, which at this point occupied territory in the southern part of mostly Mayan-controlled island, was no longer protected by the Shogun, which meant that their territory was a fair game for everyone around them. Inevitably, that meant that their long-standing Uesugi foes would soon cross the strait and finish the conquest, but at this moment they were too busy with their own wars, which opened a way for Akatani armies to fully unify their home territory. It was a dangerous move, but the Queen wasted no time. As soon as the news reached her, she sent word to her war chiefs to recall their garrisons and gather all of their men, and march southwest to attack Ando territory before they fall prey to one of the other local clans. What she did not know, however, was that Yasuse Ando was not a fool. The merchants that returned to Akatan had to cross through his territory, and so he had his own men keeping an eye on them. Once he was reasonably sure that the attack would come, he quickly rallied his remaining retainers and levies and ordered his general, one Takasue Tendo, to lead them north as quickly as possible and attack Agatani army before it could consolidate and organize. And his plan worked, to an extent. After several days of quick, forced march, General Tendo reached a forested valley in which Agatani army was set to rally. Their camp was a mess. Around half of the force was not even present yet, including Ainu raiders, and those who were here were mostly disorganized, as their camp, while cluttered, had almost no prepared defenses. Seeing such an opportunity, General Tendo rallied his horsemen, 2,000 of best Ando samurais, and led them on a daring charge against disorganized Mayans, ordering his infantry to follow him and join the fight as soon as they were able. It was a dangerous move. After all, even with just half of Akatani army present, the Ando cavalrymen were outnumbered around 2 to 1, but their commander hoped to use the element of surprise, caused by their sudden arrival, to break Mayan morale and force a rout, during which his horsemen could easily slaughter fleeing tribal warriors. 
And so, on a hot July day, an avalanche of samurai raiders charged forth towards Akatani camp, where levies and warriors alike ran in all directions, with commander of the royal guard desperately trying to form some sort of defensive formation. And if not for the fact that under warriors were tired from their long march and their advance was not as rapid as they wanted, the battle could have gone far differently. Still, the samurai charged forward. Then, they raised their long bows and loosed a rain of arrows at a distance that Akatani archers could only dream of. The arrows easily pierced light shields and armor of Bayan troops, but instead of continuing their barrage, the raiders stormed into the camp, scattering defenders left and right with their superior weapons and training. These were, after all, the greatest warriors of the land, men who dedicated their whole lives to master their weapons, so that they became extensions of their will. Mayans, on the other hand, were still poorly adapted to fighting cavalry, but in this case, this sudden charge actually worked in their favor. As Ando raiders charged deeper into the camp, they lost the impact of their initial charge, and were soon bogged down, with their horses quickly turning from assets into liabilities. Akatani warriors were not used to fighting cavalry, true, but they knew that in order to level the field, they had to unhorse their enemies, and in tight corners of their camp, groups of spear-wielding levies could easily swarm their foes and slaughter their mounts. Still, even without their horses, the samurai remained deadly enemies, and soon the center of the camp turned into a bloodbath. But, at the same time, the infantry that followed these raiders realized just where exactly the remaining Akatani army was. As they were still on the way into the camp, the forests and hills around it suddenly echoed with war songs and blood-curling howls of wild warriors. The Ainu raiders and the remaining Mayan force charged from all directions, and quickly surrounded Ando levies who, without support of their cavalry, could only tighten their formation and hope to hold on. But while the samurai were used to conflict, these levies were not, and the sight of wild, club-wielding warriors painted like demons from the underworld was too much, and many fled, even before the lines clashed, only to be run down by the Ainu. And when the lines did clash, the battle was over quickly. Obsidian clubs were not sophisticated weapons, but they were more than enough to dispatch terrified infantrymen who, after less than 15 minutes, started to throw down their weapons and begged for mercy, something they had not expected and yet, to their surprise, received. Instead of continuing the fight, Akatani warriors disarmed their opponents, left them under Ainu watch and charged into the camp, surrounding the samurai there on all sides. At this point, the battle was over. Ando retainers simply wouldn't accept it yet. Their swordsmanship might have been second to none, their morale might have been high, but even the best swordsman can't do anything when he is swarmed by dozens of enemies at once and can't even raise his weapon in the crowd. Three times the Ando warriors tried to break through, three times they were repelled, and the ring of Mayans around them tightened. General Tendo tried to take down Akatani commander, and even managed to wound him, but in the end he was forced to fall back, as his men were slaughtered by the dozen all around him. In the end, only the general himself and four of his closest retainers managed to flee back south, the rest of his 3,000 strong army were either dead, wounded or captured. In return, they managed to take down around 800 Akatani troops and a handful of Ainu raiders, a poor exchange in the end. The trap set by Commander Balam worked perfectly. Fighting in the open field would have been far more dangerous, but thanks to his ruse, his enemies charged into his position all on their own, losing all advantage their cavalry gave them. What's more, the Mayan army was still mostly intact and could march south almost immediately, despite wounds suffered by the commander. And that's exactly what they did. Another battle against native inhabitants of these land was theirs, and now they just had to follow through to fully secure the island. Just like before, it seemed that the follow-up pursuit and siege would be nothing more but a formality. Ando army was destroyed, and there was no hope for any reinforcements coming in from the mainland. The Shogun has officially forgotten about Yasuse Ando and his remaining people, and now they were left on their own, with crazed invaders from a distant land charging towards their last remaining stronghold.
but the daimyo would not just give up. He knew that the war was lost, and yet he was determined to hold his ground for as long as he could, and so he barricaded himself and his remaining forces in Oshina Castle and prepared for a long siege. He still had some tricks up his sleeve after all. He knew that Mayan invaders were not good when it came to sieges, not to mention that keeping their army supplied during such a long operation would most certainly drain Akatani coffers. He also had one thing these tribals did not. Warships. A handful of Boonas was not enough to even consider a naval invasion, but he could use them at will to harass Akatani coasts without fear of retaliation, as his enemies either could not or would not construct any vessels of their own. It was a long shot, but if he could bleed Akatan long enough, maybe he could force the attacking army to withdraw to protect their lands. But, as it happened, actions of General Tendo held with that plan more than warships. That wound that he inflicted on Commander Balam turned out to be fatal. As Mayan forces arrived in Oshima and set up the siege camp, their general was already at the end of his life, and when he died, chaos erupted within his force, as almost every single war chief made a move to become a new commander. The chaos was so intense that the army was forced to fall back into Akatani territory, where the queen had to personally nominate a new officer to lead it, one Bakan Anakupech. An unremarkable officer in most manners, but one known for his loyalty to the throne, and his ability to keep other war chiefs in line. A poor exchange for Commander Balam, to be sure, but at the very least the army could now resume the siege, which it did with renewed vigour, as Queen herself joined them for several weeks to oversee the action. It was also there when she realised just how important her common soldiers were. The warriors and warchiefs were the elite, but despite their own wards, the army marched on the backs of the levies. Common foot soldiers taken from the fields to wage war in the name of the Queen most of them would never even see. These men carried supplies, built fortifications and formed the main line of the army, making them crucial for the warriors, as they were the anchor upon which they could base their more elaborate manoeuvres. Once she saw that, the Queen, after long negotiations with war chiefs who were infuriated by her idea, decreed that from this day forth, even those common levies could attain higher ranks in the army, as long as they proved their value to the throne. It was not a popular decision amongst the nobility, and some of the war chiefs even abandoned the army altogether in protests, but their grumblings were muffled by cheers of common soldiers, who now praised their Queen for her benevolence. These same soldiers would then spend months in the trenches around Oshima Castle until one day, over a year after the first siege camp was established, when the gates were suddenly opened. A handful of starved, broken men stood there, their hands raised in a gesture of surrender. They approached the lines and told Akatani General that they gave up. Knowing that his last resort plan failed, Yasuse Ando finally committed suicide, aware that he would most certainly be sacrificed to Mayan gods if he surrendered to them. Once he ended his own life, some of his remaining troops followed his example, while the rest gave up all hope and threw down their banners. And, to their surprise, they were treated mercifully. They were fed, and after disarming, most of the commoners were told that they are free to return to their homes. Except from now on, they would be subjects of Akatani throne. It was over. The war was done, Akatan stood victorious, and the island of Hokkaido was united. The new subjects of Mayan Queen were not too pleased about it, but at the very least they were happy to keep their lives. In fact, some of the more high-ranking Ando officials even joined the court in the floating city, knowing full well that they were no longer welcome on the mainland to the south. The Queen kept them under close watch, but in the end they proved to be useful. If anything, their contributions were immensely beneficial to Akatan, as they helped to reorganize the nation from a backwards tribal society into a medieval-like system, very similar to the one daimyos of Nippon used, but modified to fit Mayan society. It seemed that everything went well for the exiles. Their new home was secured, their new neighbours became their fellow countrymen, and the curse of vengeful gods seemed to have no effect on this land. But in the floating city, the Queen and her court kept nervously looking to the south. They managed to deal with a single clan, but out there, there was an island filled with them, all eager to expand their power into Hokkaido.
and only gods knew what would happen should one of these clans actually prevail over others and unite them into a single force.